Hello and welcome to Unstress. My name is Dr. Ron Early. I'd like to acknowledge the traditional custodians of the land on which I am recording this podcast, the Gadigal people of the Eora Nation, and pay my respects to their elders, past, present, and emerging. And as I say every week, and I truly believe this, we have so much to learn from our First Nations people about connection and respect to everything really, the land, each other, our history, our environment. Um, We have so much to learn. Well, today we're going to explore EMF radiation, electromagnetic fields, electromagnetic radiation, which we surround ourselves with each and every day of our lives. Uh, It is when we electrify our home, when we... um, make it a smart home where Wi-Fi connects all things, the internet of all things. And the thing that often intrigues me, and I'm, I'm, look, I surround myself with technology, so please, this is an exploration for me. And as I've often said, each week I get to ask people that know much more than I do on subjects that I'm interested in, and they ask, they answer those questions, and I learn so much, and I hope you do too. But let's face it, uh, every cell in our body is an electric current, works on electric current, microcurrents. That's how things get across cell membranes. That's how things get transmitted along our nerves. That's how our energy is produced in every cell of our body. So so to uh, suggest that electromagnetic radiation or frequencies have no biological effect is naive at best and negligent at worst. And so today we're going to explore that. My guests today are from Spectral Design, a company that focuses completely on on this subject. Marco Simeone started as an electrician working in one of Australia's largest scale government infrastructure enterprises. Now, Marco like many people in health, developed a debilitating chronic health condition. After finding no solutions in mainstream medicine, he went to find alternative ways to heal himself, a journey that took him around the world. And through this time, he discovered the biological effects of environmental stressors and their impact on the body. Now, that's a subject that we've explored many times from many different uh, perspectives. And as you know, if you followed the program, environmental stress is one of the five stressors that compromise immune function, promote chronic inflammation. But I'll continue. By reducing his exposure to man-made electromagnetic fields uh, and artificial lighting, his healing process began and became an instrumental part of his journey to health. His motto is to live in harmony with nature, akin to our ancestors before us, to live the way our biology intended. And after completing his EMF study with the Australian College of Environmental Studies, that's uh, Nicole Bilgemer is the principal of that college. She's been a guest on this podcast many times. Uh, In Australia, he, he then undertook countless hours of further research and study with scientists, practitioners and engineers. Now, this is the case. Once we finish our study, our learning really begins. And Marco is a good example of this. Now, Marco has successfully combined his skills as an electrician with the principles of low EMF environments to help his clients all over Australia. He's passionate about developing new solutions, such as the successful home dirty electricity filter that is powerful enough to filter solar inverters and incoming dirty electricity from the power distribution grid. Now, we talk about dirty electricity. We talk about what that means. We also talk about solar inverters because, as you'll learn, the solar panels on our roof are a DC current, and uh, we need to convert that to an alternating current, and that's what an inverter is, and it has the potential to emit electromagnetic radiation as well. My other guest is Kara Keeley. Now, Cara discovered the importance of building biology when she became ill in her own home for an extended period of time without realising that mould was proliferating behind the walls. Now, we've done many, many, well, we've done several programs on on mould, and and I would uh, recommend that you go back and have a listen to it because that is an easy one to miss. But if you sort it out, it can really be life-changing. After this mould exposure, 
Kara became sensitive to electromagnetic fields in a way that she had never experienced before. And this is the significance of all these stressors, because as one mounts up on the other and compromises immune function and promotes chronic inflammation, we lose our adaptive capacity and our resilience, and we become far more susceptible to a whole range of issues. Now, as a health practitioner with a Bachelor of Health Sciences, uh, Services, rather, Cara, Cara experienced firsthand the impact of environmental causations to overall health, specifically within the indoor environment. Now, it's sobering to know that while you might be uh, overcome by the enormity of climate change and environmental degradation, it's also sobering to know that by making informed decisions, you can reduce your environmental stress in your own home, which is the main source of environmental stress, by 80 or 90%. So this is a real classic example of having control, more control than you think. This led her to complete an advanced diploma of building biology in Australia and then specialise in electromagnetic fields after further study at the Building Biology Institute in New Mexico, USA. Kara strives to help educate people on the impacts of hazards in our home, a very important topic, and why they need to be considered in a holistic approach to health. Could not agree more. She is currently the main lecturer for electrobiology component of the Advanced Diploma in Building Biology course at the Australian College of Environmental Studies. I hope you enjoy this conversation I had with Marco Simeone and Kara Keely. Welcome to the show, Cara and Marco. Thanks. Hey, Thanks for having us. Well, listen, the topic we're talking about is something that is constantly affecting us all, but I wondered if we might just start with some basics because we're talking about the electromagnetic spectrum and we know visible light is part of that, but what else before any electricity came along, what were we exposed to uh, as humans walking the earth for hundreds of thousands, if not millions of years? Where was our starting point? So essentially, our body is kind of adapted to a lot of natural radiation. So we've got the Schumann resonance. We've got the Earth's natural magnetic fields, which are DC current. We've got sunlight, obviously. So we've had a lot of, yeah, EMFs that we were kind of accustomed to and that we kind of try to get back into how those impact us and how those yeah how we kind of evolved with that so that's kind of our mm -hmm. what, what about the Schumann's I mean that's about the the earth has its own frequency that's what we're talking about mm -hmm. there yeah so there's there's a lot going on um the Schumann resonance is basically a result of uh lightning so you get about 50 lightning strikes a, a second uh, globally. And what you have is like uh, a cavity between the earth and the ionosphere. So basically you get this standing wave effect as a result of that lightning. And that was discovered, I think, around the 50s, uh, around then. So yeah, that's that's one of the ways, one of the fields that we've been exposed to. There are scientists that theory theorize that. We sort of sync up with that, with our brain waves. They are in a sort of similar band. So, you know, that is definitely a possibility, I'd say. Um, yeah. yeah. And yeah. one of the ways that we realized how important it was as well when they sent astronauts into space and realized that they get really sick if we don't actually have those frequencies that we're exposed to. So, yeah, and the protective yeah. areas and stuff as well. Yeah. Yeah. Because yeah. we, we've evolved over, over millions of years to the point when we ended up with electricity um, in, in, you know, I think it was around the late, 19th century in our home in our office in our world what are we actually exposed to now so yeah so look we we were only exposed to dc so the natural frequencies were are, are all direct current now we've gone and created uh, a way of using electricity um, which is ac so that means alternating current so the way to to differentiate those two is with a battery um, the power will go from one side of the battery to the other, and that's it. Whereas with AC power, the power goes back and forth like that. Mm -hmm. So it's sort of just, you know, basically the whole grid, the whole electrical grid, the, uh, you have current which is just doing this, and that's why it's an alternating current. It just changes instead of just mm -hmm. going one way. 
it'll go both. So we brought that in and basically the natural fields we were exposed to, you know, one of the main ones is like the sun's uh, photons, right? So we had a natural spectrum, uh, the visible spectrum. Then we've also got UV and infrared, which make it through. Now we evolved to those frequencies. We developed biological systems and, and uh, we developed a circadian clock, which harmonizes us to nature, basically. So we messed with that completely when we started to bring in like um, incandescent globes and stuff like this. What you get with those is you get um, some blue of the spectrum, some blue and green, which previous to having no, the, that AC introduced, we were just using flames basically as a light source. So minuscule amount of blue and green in, in a, in a um, uh, candle. So we've now introduced um, blue and green into that spectrum. Now, blue and green has been shown to suppress melatonin production. So basically the, the, how, how it used to be is uh, you wake up to the sun's, uh, to sun, sunrise and then that will trigger certain biological processes in the body. Um, you start to produce tryptophan, serotonin, stress hormones. And then at night, in the absence of blue light, uh, that serotonin that's created during the day will convert to melatonin. You start yawning and you go to sleep. It's a natural circadian process. Um, so we disrupted that with mm -hmm. green lighting, and that's just throwing everything out, basically throwing the system out. So then the other issue with the, having that was um, the fact that the lights are just flickering on and off. So we use a 50 hertz um, AC power in a home. So the power cycles 50 times a second and it's at 240 volts. So when you have back then, it was like incandescent lighting, the lights would literally sort of turn on and off 100 times a second, 50 one way, 50 the other. So we're not used to that. So the brain's got this constant flicker and it sort of needs to, it's a stress state that, that you go into because you've got to, you've got to filter that out. And there's studies which show like negative effects. Um, so you know, that, that was lighting. And then in terms of like AC um, and the issues with AC power is what you have is this expanding collapsing field around like all cabling, um, all appliances, the um, transmission lines in the street is expanding and collapsing electric and magnetic field. And, um, you know, the, I'm just an electrician. I'm not a, not a physicist, but like if you, if you look at physics, you, you'll see that it's changing fields, um, which it's called uh, mutual induction. Um, this is my guess on, on, look, you can measure these effects. It's just a guess on the actual process, which is causing them. Um, I think it's via just in simple terms of something called mutual induction. So as a field will expand and collapse, you have a changing field. It's been, it's very clear in science, in physics, that a changing field can induce a, um, uh, the same field inside a conductor near it. So basically the human body is a conductor. Now, if you stand in parallel with like a light switch, for an example, and you've got this changing field and you, basically that field will appear in the, those frequencies will appear in your body now at a much higher rate when it's above 2000 Hertz, this is something called dirty electricity. Um, we've now, you know, basically mm -hmm. we just had very clean electricity sources, kettles, toasters, incandescents, lights and stuff. Now we've brought in electronics and by bringing in those electronics, we've now got all these high frequencies on that line as well. So it's not just the 50 Hertz frequencies. You've got thousands of other frequencies and I read this every day and um, basically they're high frequencies. So again, in physics, you'll find that the higher the rate of change, which is the frequency, the easier it will penetrate the, the skin. Um, so now you've got all these mm -hmm. frequencies on the wire, you stand in its vicinity and it will push currents internally in the body. And you can measure this with an electrician's multimeter, a high standard one. Yeah. Mm. So coming back to uh, just because you mentioned dirty electricity is over 2000 hertz and, and um, we started off by talking about the Schumann's uh, frequency resonance in the earth that we've been, that we've evolved with really, that we have literally evolved with. Just to put a figure on it, I, I, I think the figure is something like 7.8 hertz. 7.83, yeah, something like 7.83, that's right. That's the fundamental. Yeah, frequency. so we've evolved with this uh, natural earth frequency as a result of lightning strikes occurring around the world every second, literally every second. It's kind of frightening to think about, isn't it? But anyway, it is what happens. 
7.8 hertz. And here we are, the lights in our house were going at a 50 hertz. Yeah. And now dirty electricity uh, through all this electronics is taking us up to 2000 hertz. We haven't even talked about Wi-Fi yet, have we? Yeah. So essentially we think that, you know, where the issue started to um, come into our homes was when we did, when we started to introduce the AC current and with that came electrical lighting Mm -hmm. next. And so that's where we think in history, we can start to see some, you know, biological effects because we're using the AC alternating current instead of the DC, which we're more accustomed to with the earth. So then as we progress, we just add, you know, as we know, we add more and more. Um, Then we get into, you know, when we're looking at microwave transmission and all that, because we're using that electricity, we're using it to then create electromagnetic fields, which are just higher in the spectrum. So we've just kind of used, utilized more of the spectrum that we can, so that we can actually have enough energy to transmit, um, you know, data through Wi-Fi and everything through space. So that's when we're, you know, increasing the energy and using that. So that, so as we've progressed in our technology and our understanding of physics and everything, how to use these things, we've just added more and more hazards to our home and our lives. We can use them in very, we think we can use them in healthy ways, much better ways. But um, yeah, there's so many different frequencies. And as you can already get an understanding of, you know, as we've gone from, you know, 50 hertz in our home wiring in Australia up to like all the other frequencies that shouldn't be there, which are like a byproduct um, of the use of electricity, which is dirty electricity, we can see that it becomes like a soup of different frequencies that we were never exposed to. So that's also where EMF the topic gets a bit confusing because there's so many different frequencies. And then each of those frequencies also, you know, if we're going to measure them or if we're measuring them or doing anything to try to eliminate them or shield them, then they all have different solutions and different measurement tools and things like that. Yeah. So so what are some examples of dirty electricity? Is the microwave an example of that? Or what, what are some examples in the home of dirty electricity? So how dirty electricity is produced is, um, so we have that 50 hertz, 240 volts AC power that supplies all homes. Um, yep. So if you take a laptop charger as an example, um, your laptop might run on 19 volts DC instead of 240 volts AC. So those little bricks that are on the chargers, yep. they will convert it from 240 AC to whatever 19, say, in this case, volts DC. So when it does that, it just sort of chops it up. Uh, and when it does that, it creates these sort of transients and that energy sort of gets dispersed on all the building wiring of the home. So off that expanding, collapsing field around all the wiring, you've now got these thousands of radio frequencies that are riding on that that you're exposed to. In the, in the example of a solar um, system, you're taking the DC energy from the sun and mm-hmm. convert that into a usable AC voltage for the house. So, you know, when you modulate it, um, you're creating, again, these transients. And they're gen- the solar inverters are generally sort of switching at about between 15 and 40 kilohertz, so 15 and 40,000 times a second. So that energy gets dispersed in all the wiring. You have this high rate of change and it just punches straight through the skin. Well, I mean, you just mentioned solar panels, which we're all excited about putting up and think we're doing the right thing, but they create a whole new story. (laughs) The inverters that take the DC from the sun and make it available. Did I hear you just say that right? 15 to 40,000 hertz? Yeah, generally they're the frequencies you find from solar, yeah. Wow. Wow. Okay. So we're really, um, we're re- really setting ourselves up. It's just, it always strikes me that this is this incredible experiment that we've all embarked on and embraced. Tell us a little bit about, you know, you come into a home and uh, your, your, your spectral design, you know, and that's, this is your business. You're coming into a home to assess how do you how do you do that? What, what what happens in a typical home visit? I'm just uh, you know I want to hear about what actually goes on. Yeah, so essentially when I guess starting from as well when someone hires us because you know EMF testing can be um, yeah not everyone is familiar with it. So it, it usually starts where somebody has an issue or they think they have an issue or they're concerned about where they're seeing the towers go up. 
like, um, you know, concerned about 5G towers or anything like that. And a lot more people are concerned about the dirty electricity from solar inverters. So we sometimes get those calls as well. So, but essentially we're doing an exposure history with someone before we go in because we, we are basically looking at this as it's an environmental health issue, right? And we come from the perspective as well. We've had our own health issues in our own homes and we've had, you know, our own struggle with environmental health and seeing it as a maintaining cause. So, you know, if someone's taking all the right supplements, going to the right doctors, doing all the right health protocols, sometimes if your environment isn't healthy or if it is the EMF in your home, say, um, causing the problem, then you're not really going to see those benefits. Like you can waste a lot of money. So essentially we come in usually when people have tried a lot of things and they realize that this might be the issue. Um, so when we go in, we get that exposure history and we take a look at, um, you know, we take a look at how people use their houses normally, because that's really important for us to see what their accumulated exposure is and what their exposure is overnight, what their exposure is during the day, how they're using their appliances, how they're, you know, are they, do they have their heat on, their cooling on overnight or when they're home, do they, you know, during the day when the solar inverter is on, then the dirty electricity will, will be higher. Or are they sitting close to ne next to a Wi-Fi router like the whole day? And this is when the symptoms might have st started. So a lot of it is basically, in a, it, it's, an, it's a problem. Each house is its own little EMF environment. And we're going to solve a problem each time. So we're taking yeah, into consideration, like I said, like their exposure history, their symptoms, how they use that space. And then we're measuring in those places and trying to replicate what they do during the day to see what their actual total body exposure is to all of the fields that we can measure so that we can really reduce that impact on them during the day. And then especially at night when they're sleeping and they don't really need to be using this technology and electricity. So we really want them to have the lowest EMF when we're trying to heal and detox and rest and repair in our sleep. It's just, you know, if we're constantly stimulated by all these different frequencies, then that's really difficult to do. So, so yeah, so a lot of it can be, depending on what we find, it can be, um, habit change, it can, and, or, you know, specific solutions, but so, yeah. So basically when we, when, so if Cara and I do a job together, cause I'm an electrician, I focus on the low frequency stuff, which is everything connected to the grid and, um, Cara mm -hmm. will focus on the high frequency stuff. So High frequency stuff is like your Wi-Fi routers, your phones, your, your you know your Bluetooth mouses, your Bluetooth and Wi-Fi devices, cellular tower radiation, um, stuff like that. Low frequency, um, I look at um, say the lighting situation of the home. Um, we break that down, then we look at the dirty electricity, um, you know, both on the the active and neutral wires, and then the earthing system. I also look at the earthing system. I think that's huge in, in this um, because I've never seen a clean earthing system. It's always highly, highly polluted. There's, I find thousands of frequencies on there. My, um, my spectrum, sorry. No, I was just going to ask because that's something so basic, isn't it? The earthing of electrical stuff. And, yeah. and I wondered if you could just give us earthing 101 and what is ideal so we know how we com how compromised we are. What is the what is the perfect? You said you haven't seen many homes with uh, a good earthing system, but w what should we be doing? What would be the best? Well, it's kind of hard because the electrical grid we utilize um, a, a multiple earth neutral um, system. So, what people don't realize, and people are always shocked when I explain this to them, is. The earthing, so if you look at a PowerPoint, the bottom, you know, you've got your two, looks like a little face, you've got your two top ones in the bottom. Yeah. That bottom is the earth point. Now, at every home, your earth is connected to the return wire of the grid at the switchboard. So basically the earth wire and the return wire of the grid are the same thing. So as power comes into your house on the active conductor, you can think of like the active is the red, it's sort of like, to keep it simple, is positive and then... The black is the return wire, which is negative, just to keep it for simplicity. Um, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. If all, you've also so the the black wire is the they're the two ones. They're the two ones, that, Marco. They're the two ones at the angle. Yes, that's right. So power comes in and out on. Okay, the, now we talk. Yep, it's a and we're talking about the vertical part. Yep, yep, and that vertical part is the earth. Right now, that is mm -hmm. a parallel return path with the neutral wire of the grid. 
So in every house, you're going to have, in some cases, a minuscule amount of current, which is on going out on that earth back to the transformer. And in some homes, depending on like resistance levels and stuff, you may have uh, a, a significant amount of current which goes through the earth back to the transformer instead of taking that return wire. But the other issue that you have as well is, is what we have with the electrical grid is it's this massive circuit and you have all these circuits within that circuit. So as you walk down your house, your as that electric field comes out and sort of couples with your body and you say if you're barefoot walking on concrete, you're constantly in this circuit uh, and it changes as you move through the home. And if you touch, say, a sink and that's connected to, um, it's got copper pipes, that cop, those copper pipes are part of our earthing system. So when you touch that, if you're barefoot, you will see current flow in the body. Um, so basically, you know, that's a, a big one for us. We, we don't want to see current in the body at all. So we look at the earthing system because the other issue that comes with the earthing system is the earthing will also radiate frequencies out into the room. People think that the earth is zero voltage, it's clean, it's 100% not. Um, the voltage of the earth in the electrical installation will fluctuate throughout the day, depending on how much power you use and stuff. But, you know, I've seen, you know, five, six, seven volts of voltage in comparison to the actual earth on homes earthing systems. I was at a job on the weekend. They had nearly one amp of current flowing on their pipes, their gas water, and also the the power points, the actual circuit, the kitchen circuit, had nearly one amp of current, which is significant. A home might only pull four amps of current at a time, but, you know, depending on their usage. So they had one amp of current on their earthing system um, and that wasn't even theirs. Turn the power off and it's there. It's still there and they've got this massive magnetic field in the home. Um, so, like, the earthing systems are just always full of current, loaded with frequencies and... Um, you in, and there's just so many variables um, and so many ways that that can negatively impact you. You know, um, it's different in in every circumstance. And and how does one? How should one effectively earth? Ideally, earth a home. Well, yeah. So you, you you're sort of bound to regulations. Like we have, uh, you've got the electrical regulations. You have to have like what's called equipotential bonding. If you've got like copper pipes, you have to bond that to the earthing system. You have to have an earth electrode. Um, you, these are things you just can't get past. So unfortunately we're stuck with that. But, you know, if you, yeah, you, you can clean it up. That You know, like I often find something that is I see nearly all the time is just earth loops and circuits in a house. And then because you've created a loop, you've created a circuit and you'll get current flow. And because you've got current flow, you've got a magnetic field. So unless you've got like a spectrum analyzer and you've got like an, an oscilloscope and, and the right gear and you can actually measure these things, you won't even know it's there. Like you can have uh, a cable running through the center of your house that's connected to a pipe, which has created a loop somewhere and you're going to have this, this uh, field emanating off of a magnetic field and slight voltage as well. So yeah, unfortunately we we can't do much about it. It's just the way things are. Yeah. Okay, so the the low frequency is the grid and the lighting and the dirty electricity, um, and it sounds like you know the regulations may not be addressing some of the subtler issues around earthing and and how we deal with dirty electricity. Is it acknowledged as a as an issue? Uh, like, do, is this accepted? You know that uh, people are aware of dirty electricity potentially causing problems in the industry. Yeah, in the regulatory bodies, I and mean, clear, it's not really this sort of stuff's not finding its way into the regulatory bodies as much as perhaps it should. Is that a fair comment? Well, so there's a few aspects to that because it, it depends on what frequencies we're talking about and how high they are. Because this is, dirty electricity is also labeled as like EMI, electromagnetic interference. So this is a known thing in the electronics community where that, that actually has to be filtered and suppressed if you're using like high tech electronic equipment because it will interfere with electronics, right? So this is where we're looking at mm -hmm. this at different levels than they are because we're looking at it at like the level of where it's interacting with our bodies and like, you know, potentially causing mm -hmm. impact for us. 
But here in Australia, the regulations are really the issue because when we're taking a look at a solar inverter for a house, say, we don't actually have to have, the standards aren't really good enough to not have those frequencies that are going to impact our bodies, but they're good enough so that they're not going to impact the electronics or something in our house, right? So, but at the same time, other, Mm -hmm. like, if you're running a solar power, if you're running a solar farm, say, they're going to do a lot to reduce that ele- dirty electricity. They know about it and they know those hom- harmonics are an issue because they are going to become more of an issue, especially on the distribution grid. They are um, aware of the issue because it will stop things from working properly. But also it's crea- it's um, if you're running a solar farm, that's, you know, that's lost money. All that dirty electricity is lost energy. Mm. So if, if money's involved and you have to make a cleaner conversion, you're going to make a cleaner conversion. So essentially it goes back to kind of the regulations and the fact that that's kind of where we're not actually protected, where we've had solar companies call us up and say, mm. hey, like, well, how are you, like, why are you measuring this dirty electricity and telling um, people that it's harmful? And, you know, we're, we're not going around doing that and av- we're just measuring it and noticing the health effects. And, you know, some people, when they have noticed as soon as they got the inverter, just as, as an example, that that's when their symptoms started. So, you know, correlation where the companies have asked us, well, you know, is there any reason we have to make it lower, um, you know, if it's within the exposure standards and, you know, there's, there's. There, there's no incentive for them to do that. So is Australia is particularly mm. bad. We think like Europe, Europe will have, has better standards for them, how much energy of dirty electricity can be produced. Um, so yeah, there it's, I think it goes back to the, to regulations and just the fact that as long as it's not interfering too much with how the distribution system works or other electronics, that it's okay. Mm. There seems to be yeah. incentives. We- Sorry, there, there seems to be a consensus. Which no, no, go on. Yeah, there's, there seems to be a consensus which is shifting that this stuff just doesn't impact biology. Yeah. So you have engineers which are, mm. are working with electronics and they're just trying to find the best way to make it work, but they're not factoring in biology at all. So they just don't look at it or think about it. Yeah, yeah. Well, well, yes, which is precisely why we're having this conversation because I think people do need to be aware that it's an issue we're going on now. Let's move on just because uh, I want to come to what are some of the effects that you've seen that some of your clients report uh, or you, you've experienced yourselves. You, you, you've had this personal experience. High frequency, though, is, <laughs> boy, I mean, talk about opening a can of worms. <laughs> yeah. Um, high frequency is how, how, do we, how, how do we define high frequency? I mean, 5G, obviously, everything. Go on, tell us what high frequency is. Yeah, so generally when we're talking about high frequency, we're talking about radio frequencies, so that's a certain part of the spectrum. So everything between 3 kilohertz to 300 gigahertz. Now that's like, that's a pretty broad range. And um, I know that there's a lot of concern about 5G, but we really just need to understand, I suppose, where these uh, frequencies sit on the spectrum. Because again, that comes back to, well, how are we going to measure them and how they impact? impact our bodies right so and then also we really need to know what frequency they are because that really affects the solutions as well so if you do need to do any shielding that's going to affect what's actually you know um effective so in terms of the impact on health um this is as well where we differ um because obviously they're independent there's independent bodies all over the world and that's where we use um, essentially, we go back to using the building biology guidelines, but there's other independent bodies that, um, you know, when they, you know, analyze the, and critically analyze the research that's available, they find thousands and thousands of studies that show that the uh, radio frequencies do impact our health um, adversely. Uh, whereas, you know, if you've got um, industry that looks at the same, then it's about, you know, they, they find a different um, finding. So essentially, we're going based off of um, as I mentioned, the research that we have available, the evidence that we have available in literature, and then we compare that to the health effects or the the symptoms that the person is experiencing, and then that's when we use that um, you know that exposure history to see what's going on. And often we can correlate it to radio frequency exposures. Um, so I suppose some of the common symptoms that we see uh, it, are when people have pressure on the head, um, headaches. Um, tingling, they feel hot. And it's interesting because especially um, we get this so often. There's so many different variables in health, obviously. So we get the calls, but it's so consistent where it's like, well, I don't know if I'm crazy, but 
I've got, you know, these symptoms where I'm feeling this way, but I'm also stressed or I also have kids or I'm also going through menopause or, you know, there's all these other factors. But generally, we can kind of weed out those other variables and find something that correlates in terms of our measurements or when they got new technology, say the MBN or something like that. But what's really common, I find with Wi-Fi exposure, especially in the the last probably two years when routers, um, Wi-Fi routers and modems started to become a little bit more um, powerful. Um, And you know how you have these mesh networks all over your home where they've got like the Google homes and, you know, so basically... It's, you know, they're setting up devices all over your house that are transmitting and receiving data. And it's basically you're creating more of a microwave, you know, in your home because it's 2.4 gigahertz is what's really common to use. And that's also what we use in a microwave, you know, and then we have our five gigahertz bandwidths. And then we also then have our 5G technology, which is at um, low band, mid band and high band frequencies. So there's a few different frequencies that we use for that technology. So, um, but going back to the symptoms of the routers and everything, we usually see that people get, um, yeah, that really the, the pressure on the head, the hot, almost like hot flushes. The other really common thing is feeling is people saying, I feel like I've got early onset dementia. And that Mm -hmm. is so common for when and when I hear that, I generally know that someone's going to be sitting really close to a really high source of radio frequency um, for you know at least a couple hours a day. And sometimes that's especially during lockdown. This happened when people had moved their offices into their homes, and they started just they had more radio frequency sources around them. And we got actually a lot more calls and a lot busier during that time because of that, because then that's when people started to realize it might, if they, if their home was making them sick, that's when, you know, those correlations started happening. So, um, you know, and then you've got a difficulty concentrating, especially in, um, yeah. And in schools, especially one of the things that we notice is if you, if you've noticed the increase in ADHD, behavioral issues with kids, all that kind of thing, neurological um, issues. And so many of them are just sitting underneath Wi-Fi access points. So that's just overstimulating our nervous system constantly. So, mm. yeah. Mm. It's, it's amazing, isn't it, really, when you think about it, that us talking and listening to each other is an electrical experience biologically. You know, like you are making a sound and I am picking that sound up and my nerves transmit that sound and every cell in my body is an electrical experience. In fact, we talk about our energy production as an electron transport chain. That's what they call, you know, what produces energy in our body. It's not called a carbohydrate transport chain. It's not called a protein or fat carb, you know, transport chain. It's called an electron transport chain. Yeah. And yet, you know, we're told, eh, look, be careful of the sun. It's 93 million miles away, but don't worry about these devices we put to our heads and in our laps. It just seems like it's naive at best yeah. and kind of negligent at worst or cavalier. I don't know. Absolutely, because that's that's the issue. It is disrupting our biological processes, which are electrical. And this is it. Mm. It fascinates me how we've gotten to this point where we don't consider that and just use technology in a safer way, because we do. And one of the things in, in research of how this causes um, oxidative stress, because I think a lot of this is because we're talking about non-ionizing like radiation. We're not talking mm-hmm. about ionizing radiation. And I think that's where, you know, because when you bring the sun in the UV, that's where we're talking about ionizing again. So this is where I think the the big difference is um, in people's thinking because it's low level. And this is where the exposure standards don't really protect us because they, we can't actually, um, you know, have that data for the long term, low frequency, non-ionizing effects of these, of these frequencies. But we do have, we do know how they, um, you know, basically cause oxidative stress and ultimately DNA damage. Um, they do, you know, disrupt our calcium voltage gel, um, gated, sorry, calcium, <laughs> calcium channels. Our calcium channels. So basically, just you know, letting um, in an in influx of calcium into our our um, cells that shouldn't be there because of um, yet yeah, how how it changes the ionization. So essentially we've 
there's so many different ways in, in which it indirectly affects our DNA and our biological processes, but people just don't give it enough emphasis because of the fact that it's not um, ionizing and doesn't have enough energy straight away to knock those electrons off the mm. cells and and produce DNA breaks and, and that mm. ultimately um, cancerous effects. So, yeah. yeah. I mean, it's kind of sobering historically to reflect on the fact that you know, I think in the 1940s, it was pretty well accepted that inhaling tar into your lungs wasn't good for your health. Absolutely. Um, but the authorities took till about early 2000s to actually acknowledge that uh, it, that's when it was admitted in the uh, Congress, US Congress, about 2006, that smoking was addictive. Um, so, you know, these things, and that was smoking, my God. You know, here we are, we're all in on this, aren't we? I mean, we're talking through technology and high frequency and all of this. So we are, we're not about to become, we're not about to shut it all down. How, what are some of the solutions? How do we live with it? How do we live with it in a healthy way? What would be some of the things that we should be doing and looking at? Um, so, yeah, look, our, our whole approach is, um, like as we just discussed, um, there are documented biological effects. Um, the theory is there as well. Like you would expect that lighting would influence your circadian rhythm. Um, you expect that um, having current flow in the body would have a negative effect, um, all of these things. So we just aim to, obviously we evolved in nature. We aim to sort of just have, have, <clears throat> have our homes as close to nature as possible. Um, we brought in all these different kinds of fields and frequencies with different amplitudes and modulation. And it's just like you can, you know, as you mentioned before, the electron transport chain, like the body is so unbelievably complex. And if you were to study these things, you could study this for 10,000 years and know nothing like you, the, the amount of compounding effects. So, you know, what we want to do is we want to just eliminate or lower or just return, return to nature as much as possible. So as an example, sort of in my room, um, what I've done is I've altered my lighting so that it's DC. Um, so it's just like, you know, you've just got a small DC field instead of this expanding, collapsing 240 volt field with all these thousands of radio frequencies on it. So I'm not exposed to that elect alternating electric field. I'm not exposed to those dirty electricity frequencies. Um, I've now, now, Marco, hang on. That that's a big that's a big statement to change your lighting from alternating current to direct current. I mean, I'm I, you know don't even pretend to understand all the physics behind that, but that's a fundamental change, isn't it? Because the electricity coming into our house is alternating current. How did you do that? Oh, look. In How did you case, change it to direct current? In this case, I've just used rectifiers. And they do produce a little bit of dirty electricity, but I set it up in a way where I filter it and I'm not impacted by that. Yeah, there's there's endless ways of doing it. Yeah, I just I, I did that, and um, yeah, so now I'm not exposed. And to that's that. still that that's still safe, electrically safe. I'm sure it is, but I'm just oh, so, yeah, safer. It's safer. Yeah. Safer. Safer. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So to go to some of the simple things that you can do to reduce your exposure. Yeah. yeah is it just, you know, essentially distance is going to um, be your best friend. Uh, and really that's what we see, you know, when we're talking about um, people who've, you know, all of a sudden had really um, strong um, bio like or symptoms to something. Sometimes it can just be that they're sitting too close to a router during the day. Cause when we're in the near field of um, devices as well, that are producing radio frequencies, the electric field and magnetic fields haven't coupled yet to go through space. So um, in a smooth wave, so they're more biologically disruptive. So any distance that we can create, and that's like from our phones, we want to be on speaker phone, you know, or have um, headphones, preferably air tube headphones so that the, um, I'm not sure if you're aware of air tube headphones, but where they just. Can't talk, I, I am, but to remind our listener. So essentially where you've got the, um, you don't have cords going into your ears as they are conductors. Um, you just have hollow tubes. So the sound waves can just pass through the hollow tube instead. Um, so things like that are really going to, you know, and in research that shows even our Panza who um, are the Australian um 
radiation um, protection agency that basically sets the guidelines for telecommunications in Australia. They have even come out now with ways to reduce your exposure to things like mobile phones and Wi-Fi, et cetera. So, um, and one of the um, the things they recommend is, yeah, distance and not talking with your phone next to your ear, because that's when you're going to start absorbing a lot of the radiation. And in the research, when, you know, a lot of people have talked about brain tumors and things like that and the potential association there but that's where you're going to start seeing more of those correlations is when somebody uses the phone on the same side of the head for like more than 30 minutes every day and if you do use it more than that you're just increasing your risk at exponentially so um, really we want to take a look at the the timing or cumulative effects during the day so just reducing that um, increasing the distance from these things. Um, also with our phones, we can turn off things like Wi-Fi if we're not using them because all of the all of our phones and all of our devices now that are transmitting radio frequencies, they're just meant to do it all the time, but they don't we don't really need them to do it all the time. So if we're not using Bluetooth, if we're not using Wi-Fi, we can turn those antennas off and we can reduce our exposure. So a lot of it's habit change. You can reduce a lot by habit change and, um, and you know, sitting further away from your router. Technically, we'd always, um, we'd always want to go hardwired um, with internet so that you basically aren't using the wireless um technology you're just using it through ethernet cables so there's so many ways that we can use it in a safer way the, the, the i mean you know the wi-fi is just ubiquitous really i mean everything i know when i was doing my own home here and and the the guy was putting some speakers up in the ceiling he said oh, i'll just put in wi-fi everywhere you won't have any cables and I said, well no you won't you're going to run the cables and that was the blue cable with the 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 little sockets and and that is preferable you're that you would say obviously that is preferable or so I you can oh that? yeah it, it's definitely preferable to reduce your wi-fi um in the home and like you know as in we can work we can go back we can um we can network all these things that's what it's called networking when we're using those ethernet cables um throughout the home so you know everything is kind of it's interesting because a lot of people are um you know depending on who you get to wire and the kind of technicians you have, some people don't even, you know, they're very shocked when you even ask for that now, but there's, it's definitely um, a good way to go. But then you, we can, you can introduce low frequency issues when you're using those cables because then we are, we are sending data then through that cable. Right. So we also yeah. have to think, well, what's that close to? Is that close to wiring? So when we take a look at lowering our exposure, um, you know, say at night, one of the easiest things we can do, too, is just reducing our electric fields around us, basically metal around us, too, because any metal is going to induce those frequencies that we don't want. So we we generally make the recommendation. Now, this is like, you know, this can be expensive. So it depends on where someone's at in their journey or how unwell they are and how much they need to do it. But, you know, having no springs in your mattress, having a metal, um, no metal frame beds, no, no metal around the your bed, you know, ultimately we would like to um, cut the power to the whole bedroom as well. But, um, you know, we, we do go in steps depending on the person's susceptibility. A lot of those things, you know, you can um, do yourself in your own home and, you know, see how you feel. But so the lower frequencies can be introduced when you're using those, hmm. you know, anything that's wired then, yeah. Hmm. I remember a friend had someone come in to do an EMF assessment of their home and found that the biggest source, and they had a lot of Wi-Fi in the house, but the biggest source was the adjustable bed um, motor under the bed that sat them up to watch TV, which was right yeah. there within, within and, and that was the biggest source of Wi-Fi, of radiation in the whole house where they were spending their entire night. On the the other thing you mentioned distance. Well, what sort of distance? I mean, you know, we're still living in our homes. What sort of distance is preferable? I mean, the further away, the better. Obviously, I guess. Yeah. So essentially, yeah, the further away, the better. But you know, when it comes to like a router, things like that, basically, you're going to be out of that. Each frequency will have its own near field that you can calculate, and this is where it gets a bit complicated. But essentially. As long as you're like, um, you know, a, a half a meter to a meter away from that, then you're going to be out of that near field. But um, 
we, we would still want more distance than that. So it's going to be as far as practical, right? Um, and mm. for an example of a phone, I'll give you an example where we see people that don't want to. One person has an issue with radio frequencies, the other one doesn't. That's quite common in a relationship as well that we see one person sensitive, one person isn't. So when, um, we, when we need to look at how someone's using their phone and one partner won't turn it off at night, then that's where we need to look at what else we can do. So we often find that the other, the person who's sensitive will cope quite well. If we just get them to put it on the other side of the room, it can be like full volume on so they can receive the calls, but then we'd get them to turn the mobile data, um, Wi-Fi and Bluetooth off so that they can receive calls and normal texts if they need to, because it's just there for an emergency, but it's not mm -hmm. constantly transmitting. And it's far enough away that it's not causing too much of a problem. Mm -hmm. So that's an example of where we can kind of um, look at distance to really reduce our exposure and symptoms if we have them. What about what about these earbuds that we're seeing? I mean, oh, I just look at that and I think that's yeah. that's Wi-Fi in your literally Wi-Fi in your ear. So it's yes, it's Bluetooth. A lot of people are under the. Um, misconception that Bluetooth is better, but really it's meant to travel less distance. So it's less energy. So technically I suppose you're going to absorb less and it's not going to have such an immediate impact potentially, but you're putting them in your ear. Now, the thing with these devices and radio frequencies is that they're measured over a six minute to 30 minute period, really close to your body. So, and not even in your ear, but like it could be, you can read the technical information for all of this um, in your phone or these devices where you can see how far away they were actually measured to determine if they were safe. And usually it's about um, five to 10 millimeters away from your ear. So it's not even on your ear where most people use them or in your ear. So, and that is for a short period of time. And that's how much radiation that you actually absorb, right? So there's no way for us to actually accurately measure our accumulative exposure and how that's affecting us throughout the day. I've got friends that sleep with them in their ears, you know, like little kid, like kids are wearing them. Their blood brain barriers are thinner. And we know that this can impact um, that Wi-Fi, you know, according to the research that that can um, decrease the blood brain barrier and let more toxins in. And that's, worse when you've got, you know, thinner skulls developing brains. So we really are doing this without really thinking about the long-term consequences. And there is not the research there to protect us from those because that's not how these things are studied or, or deemed to be made safe. Mm -hmm. Well, I mean, you've raised so many issues here today that we literally are bathing ourselves in. If we were just finishing up and um, and and uh, going to give our listener a couple, I mean, obviously, to know that there are building biologists that can come in and assess this is a subject we've covered a few times, and I think it's worth reminding our listener about the fact that this is available and potentially an issue. But if someone was listening to this and going, "Yeah, look, I think I should be just, I should be taking some care here." What would be what would be a couple of tips that would you give people very high level that would get them you know heading in the right direction? Yeah, absolutely. So I mean, it, yes, it does sound a bit doom and gloom, but this is there is absolutely so much you can do with behavior and and just um, starting to realize what the sources are that um, you know, and then you can start to minimize. It, because, like, you know, we live in this world, like um, I was sensitive to EMF after a mold exposure and I've definitely come back from that and I can use technology in a safer way. And a lot of people can. Right. So I think it's really important to know what we have control over in our homes and really minimizing our um, exposure at night is going to be a really great place to start. Just starting even by turning off your Wi-Fi router. You know, um, and just knowing that some some of them will still transmit even if you turn the Wi-Fi off. So actually having that off at night is just a really good place to start, um, you know, and you can have impact from external sources. But just starting with what you do have control over in your home is going to make a huge impact. Sometimes we see um, people's symptoms just alleviate just from habit change. And so that's really important for people to know. Um, and you know, the way that you use your phone, as we mentioned, makes a huge impact. Turning off your Wi-Fi at night, just changing um, the way that you use your lighting as well can have a huge impact if sleep is an issue for people. 
So it doesn't mean you have to go and change your whole home. Um, you know, all the lighting in your home, you can just put on lamps that have a better spectrum of light at night. Um, you can just, you know, turn off that really um, bright task lighting and make sure that at least one hour of preferably two hours before bed, you're using um, the like there's no blue lights or the, the dimmer um, amber lights, things like that. So um, salt lamps, things like that. Salt lamps generally have a good spectrum. We see a lot of people who already have those. So then we would just say, we'll just use those, um, you know, while you're winding down to go to bed. So anything we can do to help our bodies, um, yeah, not to press that melatonin and, and make it so that we can rest and repair at night is good. Um and just being aware of the sources that are in our home and especially in our bedrooms um, and knowing, you know, if, if you're sleeping um, on the same side of a wall with a smart meter or um, a switchboard, because in Australia, a lot of the homes, they'll have the switchboard or um, in the, the meter box with the smart meter in it on a main bedroom. Um, it's really important to just create distance away from that. So obviously, just if you can take a look at the, um, you know, the your home and the design and how it's laid out, you can just move your bed even just from one side of the room to the other, which would help. Um, it's not going to eliminate it, but all these things will help and reduce your total accumulative exposure. I'll mm. just, um, I'll just add to that. Like it, <clears throat> a lot of the things Cara mentioned, the, just the, the simple things that can be done and that, you know, they generally don't backfire, but Sometimes, um, for an example, hardwiring your device or your laptop or something, you can introduce like a significant electric field in. Um, so basically with, with the, like, you know, basically turning the Wi-Fi off on your phone, turning the Bluetooth off, changing your wireless, uh, your Bluetooth mouse to a wireless mouse and all these things that they're simple and they don't really have many kickback effects. But a lot of the time you do get kickback effects. Like if you put up um, some shielding to block a, a cell tower's radiation, for an example, you can see an increase um, from reflection basically coming back. And if you put like um, a plug-in dirty electricity filter in the wall, for an example, you can reduce one of the fields, but in, you introduce another. So there's it's it's actually pretty complicated. So every time you do make changes, you should be testing to make sure that it's worked mm -hmm. as planned and you haven't created kickback effects. And, and there are a lot of devices and a lot of claims because, you know, it's obviously known that this is potentially a problem. But here, um, you know, buy this and it will protect you from EMF radiation. And we want to believe. Should we? Should we believe? <laughs> so I think, look, um, optimistically, I think we're going to get there in terms of making products that are going to help us more. Because especially with, you know, yeah, there's the demand for it. People are aware of it. And I think that you know, the health effects are going to start to become more known. But um, with that, look, we've honestly seen where people we're just um, concerned about it. sometimes it's a waste of money because it's, you know, you can spend thousands. We've been to places where they've spent thousands on these devices, but we go in and we can just change the setting or turn off the router. And that was their main problem. Right. Where it's like, so I think that there is a place for them and they all claim they all work a little bit differently. So you do have to look at the technology it's based on. But, you know, it, it is very hard to replicate the studies and the, the independent research that they say that they have to back them up. And if we can't, we're sitting in a space where if we can't measure the difference with our meter, then we don't really recommend it. But we don't say we don't say that they don't work. Um, I do think they work for certain people. And I do think that there's a comfort there as well. And you're producing kind of more energy that helps our body cope with the, with these man-made fields, right? But our space is, well, we want to reduce those man-made fields first, because what's the point in spending the money and using these devices to help our bodies harmonize if we don't eliminate the problem to begin with or reduce the problem? So it's more that we, it's more like a holistic approach, right? It, they need to be used in conjunction with and um, and like Marco said, with the plug-in filters and with, um, you know, it's the same with devices. It can be a false sense of security. Um, so I really think that if, if people really want to um, get more control over the environment, getting your own meters, getting consumer meters and starting to measure and to understand and to, you know, so you can see how your exposure is actually reduced, then that can give people a lot of peace of mind to just feel like they've got control over where, you know, I think that's a lot of it, yeah. Hmm. Well, Marco, Cara, thank you so much for joining us today. It's been really a topic we all need to be engaged with, so thank you so much. 
No worries. Thanks for having us. Well, it's a big topic. It's seemingly overwhelming. But with knowledge comes power. And if you are waiting for the authorities to regulate this, I think we are going to be waiting a very long time. There is just simply too much involved, too much money and lives involved. And it is such an integral part of every single one of our lives. There's no question about that. And we're not going to switch off technology. I mean, we're just not going to uh, get rid of technology. So we have to learn about the, the potential problems and how to mitigate them. And often distance is, is our best friend here and turning stuff off, particularly when we go to sleep at night. Look, this links back to a holistic approach to healthcare. Sleep is the undoubtedly the most important part of the day. And as we're discovering, quantum biology underpins so much, in fact, everything of what we do on a cellular level. And on a cellular level, it's so interesting to note that um, the thing that produces energy in our body, the mitochondria, go through what is called the electron transport chain. So when we eat nutrients, be they carbohydrates, fats or proteins, they get broken down along with water and they drive the electro, electron transport chain to produce energy called ATP, adenosine triphosphate. Interestingly, adenosine, that molecule, is what pushes us into sleep pressure. It's, it's the chemical that builds up in our body and causes sleep pressure. But I digress. Mitochondria is where the electron transport chain occurs, not the carbohydrate transport chain, not the fat transport chain, not the protein transport chain. We are literally talking on an anatomical level about the movement of electrons. So as I said at the beginning of this program and, and during it, to assume this has no biological effect, uh, be it positive or negative, is naive at best and negligent at worst. And the authorities are just not going to tell us that. Witness the fact that uh, mercury is a classic example of how regulatory bodies work. Now, mercury is half of what amalgam fillings are, the silver fillings in your mouth are mercury. Now, when a dentist does an amalgam filling, it is illegal for him or her to put the little bit of leftover that he hasn't used on the patient in the garbage or toilet or down the sink. The EPA, the Environmental Protection Association, the NH and MRC, all the regulatory bodies make it very, are very clear that we do not want to pollute the environment. But guess where the regulatory bodies feel the only safe place to store this material is? In a human being. So I offer that to you as an example of the health intelligence of, of regulatory bodies. We talk a lot. I talk a lot about IQ, EQ, and HQ. IQ we all know about. EQ is emotional quotient, very important. But HQ is your health quotient. That is a function of both your health and your knowledge of the issues which affect that health. And I would argue that regulatory bodies' knowledge of those issues is based on how they approach mercury, one of the most toxic elements in the world. Um, how they approach that is a good example of how they approach environmental toxins. So you've got to take control of this yourself. And it's good to know that by making informed decisions, you can reduce your environmental stress by 80 or 90%. Look, we'll have links to spectral design. I think there's a lot of great resources on there. And, and have a listen to the episodes we have done with Nicole Bilgemer and, uh, and Lynn McLean very early on about EMF radiation and uh, David O. Carpenter, one of the world leading researchers on it, and many others. So I hope this finds you well. Until next time, this is Dr. Ron Wick. This podcast provides general information and discussion about medicine, health, and related subjects. The content is not intended and should not be construed as medical advice or as a substitute for care by a qualified medical practitioner. If you or any other person has a medical concern, he or she should consult with an appropriately qualified medical practitioner. Guests who speak in this podcast express their own opinions, experiences, and conclusions.